something that you can take home and, and work on your own model so that when you when it's down on the table and you know it's it's you really want to have people want to know who you are in the sense that when you put your work out when you do this the, the, the stuff that you're trying to do whatever it is that you're trying to do and, and all those kind of things working with the techniques and, and obviously all the various products and stuff but you're the determining factor of, of how it's all going to come out and, and trying to really improve those kind of things with you guys is really the goal of what the books are about um, and really improving everything <clears throat> So I brought some display models just to get me into kind of talking about what we're going to do because I've got a couple of things we're going to go over today. Um, so I've got 70 second scale, 230 fifth scale armor pieces. Um, the techniques that I've used, um, I think so. Don, no, I think we're good. All right. Okay. Enjoy the show, guys. So I brought some stuff uh, basically to just kind of show you the end results of a lot of things, but all the processes that I use are extremely simple. They're, you know, I, I do things a little bit different than a lot of other guys do, and I think a lot of you that follow this stuff probably know that by now, and, and how I kind of approach the hobby, how I approach everything. Um, and then just kind of taking this to a level where I think I could, I could educate you guys in a similar thing so that you can do this on your own, feel confident about it, be enthusiastic about it, um, you know, and cut through some of the model stashes that we have in our closets and, and in our garages and stuff that we store all this stuff in and, um, you know, start producing more and more work over time because there's so many kits, there's so many stuff to do, there's, it's endless as you guys all know and it's, when you, when you get bogged down by kind of all of these kind of things that we, you know, throw at you, it's, it's something that you really want to um, <clears throat> kind of cut through. And, and kind of move forward. So you're going to see today some some probably very interesting simplistic stuff that you may not be aware of, like how I do it. Um, and I think with the camera and the setup and what we're doing here will be really nice to kind of you guys can see my brushwork. That's really important. Um, you can see how I how I operate um, with with the various chemicals, and that's almost more important than the label on the on the bottle. So it's really it's really something to, to discuss and, and to go over. Um, this this poor guy, this poor guy was. Uh, this is the test model demo model I've been using for the last couple of, of seminars. So I brought that just to show you, you know, um, simple hairspray stuff, some chipping, uh, some oil paints, and then going right into pigments. And then this is the the model for today. Um, I prepped this at home, the Hetzer, before I came in. Uh, just put a red primer on it, uh, some hairspray. I put some some Dunkel gelb on it, and then I immediately started to chip it. Uh, this was a couple hours in the, in the hotel room, um, and then I made a little oil paint thing, and then, um, you know, started to weather it, and that's all I did. I didn't do anything else. I didn't do filters. I didn't do varnishes. I didn't do anything else. I didn't, I didn't get 50 bottles of different stuff, and I just made a simple little thing. I can do that and do the entire model, basically, in that process, and when I started to realize that I could really do that and, and really determine that, and it's, it's, it's using a couple of brushes. Um, you know, a couple of brushes, some thinner, and some oil paints. I can do a lot with it. And that's something I think, as time goes on and now, you know, there's new brands of oil paints, there's, there's other products in this stuff. You'll see me move away from enamels and lacquer thinners and some other really harsh chemicals. Um, one of the things that's happened to me personally was I had a really nice dog, and my dog passed away, and I kind of thought to myself, all that lacquer thinner and all the enamels and everything I used to use, I'm just thinking, okay, I'm done with it. So I've kind of taken that approach of, of going basically hardcore acrylic, water-based, um, and then a, and a little bit of odorless thinner for the oil paints. I no longer spray Tamiya paints with lacquer thinners. I no longer do that stuff anymore, and that's really recent. So a lot of you guys that read all this stuff, I talk about it, but I've had kind of a change of heart. But we've, we've got some new products that, that I've actually been involved with. Um, Mission Model Paints, you guys may have heard of these. Uh, it's a new American brand. Um, I did the graphic design for them too, it might be a little obvious. <laughs> um, He's a good friend of mine, the, the gentleman, John Campkin. And so I'm kind of getting to a point where in my own personal work, my own dealings with this stuff, uh, the chemicals that we use all the time, because I do this all the time, um, you know, being healthy and all those kind of things became kind of a more important factor. So I've kind of, I've gone a different direction a little bit. Uh, however, the good thing is some of the new products that we've got today, um, they work even better than some of the old stuff we've been using for the last five, 10 years. So that's really nice. Um, and they do appreciate that. And then from there, 
Um, I'm going to probably keep working on some of this stuff in front of you guys today. And what I'd like to do is I really like it when you guys ask questions. So do not be shy. If you have something you want to know how I do it, if I don't show it today, feel free to ask. Um, more than happy to, to demonstrate anything. Um, so I'll basically do in a little bit of, I'll do some chipping today. Um, I'm not going to waste a lot of time airbrushing in front of you guys because that's a little bit on the boring side. Uh, nobody wants to watch the paint dry. And then I'll do a lot of the oil paints and really talk about kind of how I'm talking about the philosophy in the books and then you're going to start seeing it in front of you and then how I kind of approach certain sections of the certain of each part of the model um, and all and so forth. And, and one of the things I was kind of trying to, I'm going to do, you'll see me expand into some other non-armor pieces pretty soon. Tomorrow will be Civilian and Gundam tomorrow for, I do a seminar in the morning. Uh, so today will be armor, but you'll see how the techniques, they're so broken down in such a simplistic Thing. I, can, I can maneuver so much easier now as a modeler when I'm presented with any kind of project from that little 70 second scale Burger Panzer to you know a full-blown historical reference research gorilla you know and then a, just a fantasy you know Strumhabitza that I just kind of made up on my own and I can maneuver and then kind of do stuff like this do stuff like this all with the same two or three different products that I use and it's very very easy I'm much more relaxed now as a modeler. I'm not stressed out. I don't, I don't sweat waiting for enamels to dry or, or, or you know, airbrushing lacquer thinners anymore and having a mask or a vent or all this other stuff that we've kind of had been forced to. So it's, it's something you know. I guess because I'm from California, so I'm a little bit more relaxed. But you know, it's going to be kind of one of those things where, um, you know, it's everybody says, oh, it's great that you, you know, your hobby is your job. Well, it's a job. You know, this really has become a job for me. So it's my career, it's what I do every day. Um, so I've had to figure out on my own how to kind of be efficient with this, how to be, you know, something I'm not stuck doing, you know, all these processes of filters and washes and this, that, and that. It's something that we've all seen for years and years and years and it becomes such a monster of a thing, I think personally. And when I go down on the, when I look at the competition tables, I can go down there and see everybody's processes. I can see kind of, you know what people are doing. I can see what you're trying to do. I can I can understand the techniques that are being involved. And so, what I'd like to do is, is show you that there's there's other ways to do things. Other ways to do things that can be combined with those processes that are much more. I guess we could call them traditional now because we've been doing it for about 10 years. And so that way you can kind of really get a flow of producing a piece of work that goes from one subject to this to this to this. And not, they're not repetitive, you know, they don't become stale, they do not become boring for you, so that, you know, um, many of you build one or two things that you like to do the one or two things. I'm a guy that likes to build a broad selection of, of subjects. Um, so it's just kind of being able to kind of take all these things and then apply them to, to what it is you guys are doing, because that's all I care about. I don't, you know, I'm not here to, 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 to really push a brand per se. Uh, I'm much more concerned about your understanding the philosophies and, and the concepts of storytelling with model building. You know, each one of these pieces here tells a story. And when I look downstairs at some of the pieces, I can, you know, I want to see stories in these. I want to see, you know, what it is you're trying to convey to everybody. You know, and it, can, and it doesn't have to have figures and diorama bases to tell a story. I think the vehicles themselves have a history. And so it's understanding, um, kind of putting that on the, on the model as you go along. And, and what's happened in my world is, is doing a project where you, where you paint it, you have a base color, you start putting your washes on, and you start moving to other steps, and it's a very step by step by step by step. I kind of came to the conclusion after a while of making about 100 models that way. Um, it, just, it just, I was not getting the satisfaction out of it. It, wasn't, it was not providing for me, uh, as an artist, something that I was really looking forward to. So what I've started to do was taking the oils in particular, as a lot of you guys now know and have read the stuff, um, with how I approach it, uh, with my art background and stuff, and, and trying to basically take a model, and then all I'm doing is start working in area. And I start really kind of telling a story about what I'm trying to do with the model. And what, what's different about this is, you'll notice the rest of this is not even touched. And so what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to tell the story of the vehicle with a couple little bit of oil paints, and then really kind of come in here and so I've applied pin washes, I've applied filters, I've applied all the things that we've, we historically do in the main overall scheme of things, but I've m managed it down to a section. And now what happens is, is, again, everybody in the room I'm pretty sure has the same problem, is when we do this, we don't do this start to finish in one day or anything like that. We have months and time and years 
to go through all of this. So what happens is I can step away from this model now and it's already started to tell me a story. So when I come back to the model, I have kind of a reference point of what I want to do for the rest of this. And that mentally totally changed how I approached all the models now. So in other words, when I start to, to paint these and weather these and what I start to work on them, they start looking like this where they're, they're like almost completely weathered and the rest of it isn't. And, and that what that does is that kind of, in the older processes, we would apply one filter or a wash or a series of stuff over the whole thing. And then we'd walk away or we'd you know, live our lives or do our jobs or whatever it is. And you come back to it and you do another thing. And what I found with that was it was really a struggle to kind of get a real good feeling of what the model's about to me. You know, even if I had reference photos and, and research stuff, it was, if, if it was historical, if I'd gone that way. What I found out now, though, for me, is when I do this like this, I can walk away and I can walk, I come back to it. If I'm busy doing something else, I can come back in a week and take a look at this and really get motivated because it's, it's, there's something there to look at. You know, just kind of like how I've done the exhaust and how I've done some of the other things in the, in the toolbox here. And I can just, and I can continue. I can sit down for an hour and I could just noodle this section here and I, or I can come in for a whole night and do a whole side and, you know, do whatever so that the model begins to kind of develop in a, in a very, very different way. And that's something that, why that become <clears throat> kind of important, especially for the contest people, because um, if this is something that you really want to, you know, you want to put your models down and you want to really move to the metal categories and, and do those kinds of things, what happens is you really become an author now. You really become moving from building a plastic kit or resin kit and then painting it and weathering it, you move it into more of an author and talking about what's happening here. So when the people come walking by, they start to see the various things and they can see the life of the vehicle come forward a little bit more efficiently. You know, I found it a lot harder to process from a wash to a filter to, you know, decals to chipping in these very st static steps that we would kind of read about all the time and even I wrote many, many years about. Um, I found it hard to, um, and the Tiger uh, was one of those where I just, I could never quite it never hit me. It never hit me like, oh, that's what I really wanted to do. Um, and so it was just various kind of doing more and more of these projects. I started to realize when I started to work with the oil paints in certain sections, I basically could skip all these other steps. I could do them all at one time. So I could take this little guy, some brushes, and some thinner. And so that was kind of a, that was kind of the, the new thing for me that really changed how I kind of have, um, move forward with the model building. Basically. I can put a paint job together. This has been painted, hairsprayed, chipped. You know, it's just all it is. There's nothing other, no varnishes or none, nothing. I don't waste my time with any of that stuff. I can go right to oil paints, and then one night I can do this. And so this tells me there's a lot of power in that. There's a lot of story, you know, ability as an author to come up with a way to kind of look at that. And then a lot of you guys might look at that and go, well, he did all the pin washes here, and then he did, you know, filters that change some of the white tones a little bit, and this, you know, put some pigments on there. This is all 100% oil paints. That's all I did. And I can touch this. It doesn't need to be varnished. I mean, if I'm going to handle a little bit, it's not going to come off because it's been dry for a couple months. But um, there's, there's, that's all that I did. And that's all that I had to do. And that was kind of the thing. Was like, I, don't I mean, I like my pigments. Don't get me wrong. I love them. They're fun. Um, but they're messy. You know, they're pain in the ass sometimes. Um, working in scale, this is 1 1 44th. So this is, you know, considerably different scale than 135th versus 172nd. So that's kind of the other ultimate factor that I was finding out when I moved from subject was how can I tell us, how can I do what I do in that size and make all you guys really understand that? And how can I do it in that size? And then how can I do it when I switch to something that's basically two or three times a smaller scale as the details because the chips have to be smaller. The scrap, everything has to come down. And, and working with kind of that step by step by step thing, it was really hard to control the scale of stuff. It becomes its own monster a little bit. So with the oil paints and the oil paint rendering that I really push and talk about, um, I'm able to really do this kind of stuff, you know. And it's just it's just a paint job, oil paints, and moving. And I could do and I could do other stuff. I mean, I could add other things to this, but just kind of that simplistic process is something that really really kind of that changed a lot of stuff for me. So that's kind of what I'm going to get into here a little bit. Um, with that said, a couple little things here. Working specifically with oils. Oh, where's my knife? That's right here. Working with oil paints. Right, 
it's the way it's manufactured, uh, the process, the the linseed oil that's inside of it, whether it's an art brand or whether it's a hobby brand, uh, even Wilders, they, they all they all have the oil inside of it. Um, I make these little cardboard pallets. For our world, for, for what we do, um, we really, um, hold on one second. I hate this double-sided tape. Anyway, I put a little piece of double-sided tape on the back so it doesn't move around when I'm, when I'm using it. Uh, I always recommend a good quality odorless thinner. Uh, whether yes. Uh, on the thinner, my question was because uh, I see that you switch to uh, acrylic paints, uh, more environment friendly, yeah. and so on. And I, I personally use a vegetable-based thinner for oh, okay. oils, okay. which is totally uh, organic. Organic yeah, and yeah. so on. But uh, maybe it becomes a little bit harder to dry, so okay. it takes a little bit longer to dry. That's okay. why you use this kind of thinner. I started so when I when I started working, uh, we had we had enamels, you had humbrels, uh, and then you have all the the Meg AK Ammo stuff, the, all those enamel products, and they have, all have their thinners, right? Their enamel thinners, enamel thinner for washes. They had all that product, and I started using them a lot. Um, they're really caustic. They're really strong. Uh, they can do some damage to the models. Um, and I did not like how they, they, how they uh, dissolved the paints. I did not like it. So the higher quality, uh, when, when they started bringing out the odorless centers for our hobby, because uh, the art, all the art, this is old stuff. I mean, all the art people have, have this for, for years. Uh, when we started using this, this is a, it's, it's much silkier. So I found that the blending uh, was much superior with, with this. And that's why I switched mainly for, for the for that purpose of it. I mean, I'll use the enamel washes and, or thinners for other purposes, but um, when, when I'm blending and, and doing this kind of work, it was too gritty. It was too, I couldn't get the effects I was after. <coughs> and especially as I, as I force myself, and this is important because what was happening was I, I have to force myself into the scale. And, and the, the thing for me is, is my determining factor is, is scale. I don't care if you want to chip it a million times, if you want to paint it pink and red and everything. I don't care about any of that stuff. But is it in scale? Is, are the effects in scale? That's, the, that's all that matters to me. So is this in 1144 scale, the, the effects that I've achieved? Is this in 35th scale, all the winter whitewash and stuff? That's when I was struggling with some of those things, some of those other hardcore products, I would start to, I would fight the, I would fight the battle. And I don't, it was too much. And I wanted to find a different, easier, smoother uh, way. And so that's when, I was happy when these came out because they actually made, they made quite a difference. So I use a series of brushes, um, Lowell Cornell, um, but anything similar size. Uh, these are just the mid-range. They're like five US, four US. It's not a, it's not expensive brushes. I I I go through them all the time, um, and then I have a couple other sizes and, and types of brushes that I use. But I can do a lot with this. I mean, I can do a lot of work with this, and that's something that um, you know we're all concerned about costs. We're all concerned about a lot of other stuff. Uh, I could I could do a lot of work with with just what's in my hands right now. So that's something that also kind of changed my mental focus was that I, I, I've got drawers of the stuff, of all the products that we have. I've got just racks of the stuff. I just, I just need a little box of oil paints, a little bit of cardboard, some brushes, and I can start to do a lot of work and then start telling some stories. So, um, and that's what I was doing in the hotel room. I was a bit jet lagged. I was a little bit, you know, I wanted to get ready for you guys. So I thought the best way to do this was to kind of jump in and work on the demo models that I brought along. And I was like, okay, let's, you know, let's get to work. So enough of me blabbing. I can talk, so I can chat a lot, um, you know, all that stuff. So please feel free to speak up if you have questions, if you want to discuss other things while I work. Uh, I will keep talking while I work, but I will, I will try to move this in a flow. Um, I do want to do some painting of camo and some chipping, uh, and then weather that. Uh, I do want to do some pigments, uh, and I've got some wheels and stuff that I've got ready. Um, so again, just to, just to refresh you guys real quick, a base coat of primer, in, in whatever color you want the chip to be, is how, you know, the simple outline of the process is basically, the red is the color I want the chips to be. And then I could do some rust if I want to do that later. Um, and then the, the top color is kind of whatever, obviously there's a Hetz or you know, this thing, but with the T34, the greens were the chip color. A little bit of hairspray. Um, 
And I do it all the time because you know what? As I'm getting older, my hands are shaking, my eyes are going bad, I cannot paint the chips anymore, even with the sponge. I just gave up. I'm just, fuck it, because I ain't, no way. So, and I, and I have to put the models on the tables because I know you guys will look at my stuff and you go, well, boy, he sucks all of a sudden. You know, and I don't want to, and I mean, it's an important thing. You know, I'm professional now, I can't do that. So, I stick with what really kind of works, the hairspray stuff, the chip, whatever you want to use, chipping fluid, hairspray, it's all of the same stuff. Um, I prefer the aerosols just because I like the, I like, I don't like to use the airbrush as least as amount of time as I can. I just hate cleaning the airbrushes, it's a pain in the ass. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So with that, uh, lots of paper towels. The tricks to this, um, and I want it, what I want you guys to do is when you get the camera, everything set up here. Okay, that looks pretty, it's a little blurry, but yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, see if you can, can you move over my shoulder more? No, oh, it's just the cover. Oh, is it this one? Okay, yeah. no problem. I can, I can move a little bit. Got the squeakiest chair in the room too. <laughs> Sorry, my old BMW does the same thing too. So I have to wear glasses all the time, so, old man. The gray hair on my chin is not fake. It's not airbrushed, all that stuff. So what I do is I have a couple brushes I like to use. Um, I'll, do, I'll have one or two for color brushes, and then I'll have a, I'll have a couple for blending. Um, and you can, you, you can use what's comfortable for you. I found that the, the more precise the tool, the more precise the effect. So if you have been working with stuff before that is um, your brush size is too big uh, or too small. Some of those little tiny little figure painting brushes are retarded. I mean, they're so ridiculously small. You can't do a lot with them uh, in, in this conversation. Um, so I try to, uh, you know, I, I found a brush that really can hold a good point for a long time, maybe, maybe a couple of models even. Um, and it can hold enough material for me, whatever I'm using it for, that I can do the work that I need to do in an efficient manner. I'm not always, always stopping because it either dries up or whatever. But what I want you to watch me though is is my handwork, uh, how I go into this. Uh, actually, let me rewet this a little bit while we're talking. Uh, so little eye drops. Is there an eyedropper anywhere? Do you see one? No. Uh, it's a, no, it's okay. I think I can manage without. Um, here, some these are. No, they're still a little bit wet. Some of the wilder old, the new oil paints from Wilder, they do dry out much quicker because he uses much less linseed oil. Um, let me just break this up. So these little cardboard pallets, I get a lot of questions about these. Um, yeah, they take like five, 10 minutes. It's kind of a pain in the butt, but you can use one for, for a good weekend or so, two or three days for sure. And what I like to do is, um, is cut these cardboards up so they fit in the little plastic containers and then they can, they'll, they'll stay fresh for a couple days for sure. Um, so and those are wider oils? Uh, these are a mix of, I've got Windsor Newtons. Uh, Windsor Newtons, by the way, if you guys are, are into color, because I'm kind of into color, um, as you can imagine. Just so you guys can see what I did. So it's, it's a lot of wilder now, uh, and a lot of 502s. I still have most of my 502s from before. I think there's new 502s now. Um, I don't know if they've changed the, the, you know, I don't know if they've changed what's in the tubes. Personally, I don't. No, I don't not. think so. Okay. Um, but I would have, if I was you guys, I would always have a burnt umber, a raw umber, and then the best rust on the planet, I don't care what company you are, is the Windsor Newton, the burnt sienna. Yeah. This is, so if you guys, if you're gonna have a staple of colors, you know, in your little thing, uh, definitely at least order up a Windsor Newton, um, these three, because those are the core colors for, um, you know, the burnt umbers are really, really almost a black brown. Um, and these are 15 years old. You know, I bought these way back when I discovered Missing Links, so still using the same two. Uh, I mean, this is, you know, there's probably a hundred models done with this thing right there. That's all I've used <laughs> barely a third of the whole thing. It's retarded. Uh, very efficient process. So I'm very, that's why I love oil paints now, obviously. But anyway, I definitely suggest the, those colors for sure because the, those are the ones on the end of this palette here that I've, that I've just always used. And then I have just a selection of other tones that kind of I know I'm probably going to be using. I always have a rag, uh, old towel, because I don't like to ruin my clothes. I don't have special clothes, you know, I don't have workshop stuff. I just work, this is, I have a couple desks at home. I work from my apartment, and it's a really small little setup now, and because I don't have to worry about all this stuff anymore, um, it's really, really easy. But anyway, to the oil paints, and to getting to this, and, and I'll show you for about 10 minutes, I'll work, the, I'll work the little panels over here, and I'll continue up kind of what I've done here. And I'll just give you an idea of just kind of understanding that it does not have to be kind of 
always traditional with what we do. You do not have to be stuck into the very traditional stuff of, of all over one time, the next step is all over one time. There's, there's other ways to get this done. And, and I like to see a lot of you guys try to embrace this a little bit and give it a shot and see what happens when you do your own work where if you can get to this point and then you can start working a section you know, with some effects and then walk away because you got to go to work, you got a life, you got family, and then come back into it and then you start doing those things. So it's it, the philosophy of this is important. Uh, that's why I talk a lot because if, if I just sit here and do this, you won't understand what's happening or why I'm doing this. And that's obviously, as you all know, to read this stuff, the why is, is the difference maker. The techniques, the, the house, everything else, that's all good. But it's, it's what's up in my head and, and what we're all doing is that's, if you really truly are looking to advance from project to project to project, it's really the mental capacity of what it is that you're trying to tell people uh, with your work. And so that's kind of what, that's what pushes me. Um, and I also, I also get rid of, I, I sell my models, I don't get rid of them. Um, because I don't, this came up in conversation last night, we were drinking, is that they asked if I've got all my, you know, my work and no. I, and I do that because if I kept this, and I looked at it and I kept looking at it, I'd fall, you know, you really start loving your own work and all that stuff. And the next one I did would look basically the same. So if I get rid of them, if I sell them, um, and not that you have to, but if you just kind of don't keep them in front of you all the time, you can advance your own work because you start to re, you, you go back to basics and you start over again and you kind of have this process and over a couple of years, you'll start leapfrogging yourself and moving forward and you know, that, and I'll get emails from guys that, you know, especially in America that, that you know, where finishes are not strong in America, the paint finishes and stuff, that it's the weakest side of, of American modeling and guys have never had a medal ever, and they start reading this stuff, and they start, okay, we, I'm trying this, Michael, I'm trying to do this. And they go and they start getting some medals, and they start, it, it starts to affect them, and they start to get more motivated and enthusiastic. And so, to me, that's what this is about, that you guys are enthusiastic, that you guys, you know, I don't really care what I do anymore. I don't compete anymore, I'm not here for glory. I just want to make sure that you guys can kind of get this, and I leave my mark at that understanding what I'm trying to do here is, is that process mental process you guys all start to really really start to embrace and there's a lot of power in this and this and this is history is storytelling and whether it's a science fiction piece or you know civilian make-believe stuff it's you're all telling a story and that's kind of the key when you see the work when you go down there and you see the work that's really like and there's a by the way guys congratulations that is one of the nicest range of models I've been to a lot of shows and I've Took photos this morning, like 500 pictures with the phone, and I was to, yeah, I was like the average, just the average quality. <laughs> Boom! The fuck out of here! What's happened? Like, what is going on? I'm like, that is not. I mean, maybe I've just been gone too long. I don't know, but it's you guys, bravo! Very impressed. Push me harder, so because now I've got to, I got to flex my muscles, and I got to push myself harder to get, you know, to a level where you guys are gonna advance to that level, and that's kind of one of the things. So. Anyway, back to this, back to all this stuff. Okay, this one I don't actually need. All right, so I'll have a color brush. I'm working with a simple color scheme, a light color scheme. I'm gonna add some dark tones to it, some rust and some whatever, just, just for the sake it's easy to see. I'm not trying to make a Hetzer perfect. It's a little bit, you know, this could be over weathered, it could be dirty, I don't really care. This is, this is really for demonstration purposes. So when I've got my colors here, got my thinner. Um, this guy I don't need. So I'll have, I have, usually one or two color brushes and then one or two blending brushes. Now you notice though, and this is another change for me recently, um, the blending brush is also the very same fine sharp tip versus the, you know, I used to blend with this one, the wider brushes a lot, um, or, you know, diff just different short style brushes and, but I found that I can do all my effects. So it's three of the same brushes, just one's color, two are for blending. So what I've got is I've, I've got, I've already put the brush into the thinner um, and I put a little bit of oil paint on it. This is probably the most, if I'm gonna say anything today that you can take home with you, the most important thing is, is the quantity of material that you guys have on your brush is critical. It is hypercritical because this is what controls what you put onto the model. So if I have a lot, a lot of oil paint on this, it's gonna become messy. And if I have a lot of thinner on this, it's going to become runny like a wash, and it's not going to be it's not going to be the effects of it because I'm I'm kind of repainting the model in essence with the oil paints. That's kind of a it's a, it's a different concept with oils, and so 
watching how much I put on the brush, watching how I use the thinner, and then how I use the paper towels to unload everything. Um, it's a very important, it's, it's, it's the difference maker of how I do this to how other people do the oils. And that's kind of one of the things I really want you guys, if you're gonna, this will come through pretty nicely. Um, that's what I want you guys to take away from this, is really look at the control of, of the brush, what I'm trying to do. Um, I'll get into a rhythm so you can kind of see how it works. Um, so in, what I use the thinner for is to control the effect. So in other words, if I have paint on the brush and the brush is fairly dry, the effect I'm gonna get is, is kind of a grittier effect. It's kind of a, a soft, cloudy blending effect. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of darken the edges up here a little bit. See, I don't have a lot of oil on there, not a lot of color. So I keep coming back and forth. I go to the paper towel. I never go from the from the from the oil to the model. It's rare. Always coming in here. You unload it because my determining factor is really going to be what I'm trying to achieve, what I'm trying to do. And just look look at what I'm doing right now. This is this is this is it. This is it's. And I'm saying this because it's this simple. And I want you guys to understand that that my brushwork. I've got my you know I've got a little bit of a shake, but I've got my my hand supported here. And I'm just trying to do some things. And I'm going to go to a little bit of a darker color here real quick. Some of these have dried out a little bit. Sometimes you have to kind of work that. Some of these oil paints dry faster than some other colors. And I'm not putting, you know, I'm not putting a lot of color on this. It doesn't require a lot of color. And what you'll find is, I get a lot of questions too about why do I not use varnishes? You know, that's a very common. Everyone's like, dude, how come you don't use any varnishes? Like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, well, you kind of <laughs> don't need them. And that's, that's something, if you look at how little, how little material I'm, I'm working with, like how much product I'm putting down, you guys see that? And, it's, and a lot of this stuff too, even with the cameras, you're going to have to actually come up and look at it a little bit later. So what I'm trying to do here though is, is just to real quickly show you by layering various colors. It's a little bit difficult to do it the sideways, but it's okay. And so what I'm doing is I'm building up the layers of a light rust color. I've come in with a little bit of a darker metal here. So I've taken kind of the hairspray stuff that I've done before and kind of enhanced a certain area to kind of maybe this, you know, this little section got a little bit more abuse. So, and I try to, I, I try to do the basics of where the crew will stand and step and, and those, because it does make a difference. Um, the, like the fender joint in here. Come in. Once I kind of get into a little bit of rhythm too, this will start to, it'll start to sing a little bit. That'll be kind of nice. So I can, I can apply dust, I can apply rust, I can apply grease and grime, all from the same palette, um, relatively quickly. So again, watching what I'm doing, you'll notice this one's a little bit wetter. The lighter color is a little bit on the wetter side, a little bit more thinner on it, because I want this to be more of a dust and diffuse. So it kind of runs like a wash. So what I'm talking about before were, I don't know if you guys can, I don't know if that's, 
kind of blurry, sorry. Um, so right now I'm basically putting like a, like a little bit more of a wash here. In a light dust color, it kind of diffuses out. And that gives me kind of a dust effect. And so what I was talking about before were when we put a wash over the whole thing. With the oil paints and working this way, I'm actually putting a wash on here, but it's very localized. It's very precise. It's very in control versus putting it everywhere, you know, and then trying to work it back and trying to eliminate it, trying to, to you know, remove stuff. So what, what the change of is I'm still putting a wash on, except I'm just doing something very controlled, and then I just come in with a little bit of blending, and I work the effects over. And so now I've got a little bit more dust in here. You know, a lighter tone against a darker tone. These are kind of some, some basic principles of color. If you say you're layering, uh, how does it work out with, with oil paints? They need some time. Everybody thinks that. What's happened is this is uh, maybe half a day old. Yeah. It's it, because I use so little product, yeah. it dries so quickly. And then with the hair dryer, and that I've discovered was, it. Do, I always worried about that. I so I, that's why I didn't use it very often because I thought oil paints would like figure painters, like the this, the figures drying for weeks, all that stuff. Uh -uh, that's because I'm putting for the effects that we're talking about. You know, like the muffler here, um, that was yellow with a little bit of chipping shown and this is all that on the muffler there is all oil paint and it's already dry and I can go back over it and it won't remove it because I'm not using heavy amounts of thinner I'm not being aggressive with my brushes so I'm actually if you watch me I'm very almost delicate and I think that's something you guys have to kind of embrace a little bit is you know I'm not slamming the brush down on this I'm not really grinding I mean I'm barely touching the model so there's very little product and that's the really it, it is that kind of the difference maker um, and that's why the smaller brushes, there's less, there's less liquid and stuff going on. And so when that started to realize that, because what will happen is I, I can come in with the hair dryer now. So I can come in with the hair dryer now. I can do more work with it. And I could, I could use... By adjusting the quantity of thinner on the brush, I, I create the effects that way. So in other words, if, if, if I dip this in there and I get uh, more of a wash effect, if I unload that brush and go mostly with more pure paint and less thinner, I can get a different kind of a concentrated effect and I can control what it is I'm trying to do. Like I can increase the opacity of the dust. You know, I can intensify the rush chipping. I can intensify certain effects by, by channeling through the thinner. So which, which is important to watch kind of how I'm doing this is that I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not doing that. I'm not loading my, you know, I'm not doing those. It's, it's, just, it's just a dip. It's like putting your toe in the pool. It's just a little dip and get a little bit of color. You kind of prep your brush with the towel. Okay, you've got, it's prepped, it's ready to go. And I can come in here and And I just put the color where I want it. So it's, 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 it's got a little bit of wetness to it. In cases like this where I'm trying to increase the opacity, just brighten the color up so you can see it a little better. And this is all very subtle, and that's kind of also I work very subtle. So, um, And I can come in and kind of draw that, put that where I want it, switch to one of my blending brushes. I, I make sure it's kind of, the one trick I do is I kind of touch my finger and if I see a lot of liquid on my finger from the brush you'll know it's pretty wet so when you when you when you do that to your finger and if it's pretty there's no sheen um, you, it's got a little bit of thinner in it but it's not going to turn it into a wash which is kind of mentally you kind of realize the power of what's going on because oftentimes before if I took my blending brush and got it wet and then went into this that would just blur it all out it would just blend it would just diffuse it and that's not what I'm trying to do it's very different two blending brushes because for two different oils. yeah yeah, and oftentimes when I'm when I'm working, working, um, I will have five or six brushes in one in my mouth, and you know all that kind of stuff. And, and it's it's uh, I, I typically so if I've got a range of colors, I have my dark rust, dark browns. I have my light grays. I have my tans, beige, earth colors, oranges. I will have a brush for each range of those colors when I'm working, working. So for you guys for today, I'm simplifying that because I don't want to overload all that stuff. I want you to watch the brushes, watch what I'm doing. Because this kind of control, this kind of precision, when you come up and take a look at this stuff and you see up close, 
the little scratches, the little marks that I made, all with the brush, really give you guys some power. You know, because what you want to do downstairs, it's got to be in scale. You know, that mark that you're putting down on that model, your, your guide, your definitive border is scale. Is it 135th size of what it's supposed to be? Is it 148th or 172nd? Because that's where, between me and all you guys or whatever it is, the levels, it's scale. There really is no differences here. And I want you guys to really embrace that because I'm not, I'm not doing anything special. I'm not really like, you know, there's no composer Mozart here with some genius, you know, something that he's doing. I'm not, no, this is just me and a little brush doing this, but I'm, I'm just, I jam myself into the scale. It's got to be, and if you can do that, you'll, re you'll see the refinement in your own work. And when your work gets refined and when you see it on the table, um, and when you look at it, you look at the chips and the marks and the, and the, the various effects and the pigments and the, and it's, if it's in the thing, the model will sing. It'll really start to pop. And that's, that's when guys walk by and they, they come back to and they look, oh, whoa, hey. You know, he's doing some stuff. And so, because it's in scale. So, and that's a critical element here. You know, when you look at, look at the little 70 second scale one, and you look at the, you know, the effects I've done on some of the other things, and how small that thing really, really is. But when you get up close to it and you see it, they, everything's in the right size. And that's why it looks the way it does. There's really, I'm, all I did was paint it orange and put some oil, you know, a little bit of oil paints and some pigments. So I keep that process simple. I simplify everything for you guys. And that's, and that's something that I think is, is, we overthink this way too much. We overthink a lot of what's going on way too much with, with the model building. So, um, and the other thing that oils too is a little bit of working time. So this has been sitting for a little bit, it's no big deal. I come in here and I can kind of blend it out to get a little bit of a dust effect and pull along. And then I can come in, I'll speed up a little bit. So the top of the ridges of the, of the fenders, you, I can come in and kind of So what I end up doing really, and, I'm, and, and what I'm looking at up close that you guys probably can't see is there's a, there's a lot of little tiny little marks from the, from the chipping and the, and the hairspray stuff that I did earlier. And it's telling me when I'm looking at this, okay, I can, I can do a little bit of something right here. I can obviously do a little bit of something right there. And I start to move, you'll see my, I, I will start to speed up here. And I start to kind of, I, I will kind of work the whole thing. Sometimes if I, if I put too much, like that's, that's like, here I'll just, let's get a little ugly. Way too much. So I can come in here and kind of. So I can kind of reset the surface a little bit sometimes. See the brushes in the mouth, it's, it's just natural. Reference photos uh, often, or just you working with your imagination mostly? <laughs> uh, yes and no. A lot of times, uh, like the grill, all reference photos. Um, try to be as historically accurate to the. It was an old photo in, in Czech Republic in '45. Um, the the little crane was more looking at construction equipment and just taking a few pieces I liked and right, just so kind of. Use it that like you yeah. Know, just to uh, precisely get the effect, you know, mm -hmm. transfer from the, the real thing, you know, yeah. to the model. But you use it as a reference, like, uh, you know, how to work with some rust and, you mm -hmm. know, stuff, just to uh, get the... Uh, rust, and also rust doesn't bleed as much as we think it does. Oftentimes rust, will, the, the chip itself could be a rusty piece of metal, but the its surrounding area could be clean, just for the nature of the use of the vehicle, so... Um, there's a lot of stuff that I like in, in context to that. I, I look around uh, my city when I'm walking around and stuff, and I'll take pictures of stuff that I like, um, you know, whether it's an old vehicle or a city vehicle that's been repainted three or four times, and like the tractor's all about that, and I do that a lot. Like I have my, my cell phone is full of all sorts of crazy pictures of that stuff, you know, 
the, the light poles that are all chipped and repainted by the city 50 times. And but you use it as inspiration, not just... Uh, yeah, it, it, I get inspired because I'll see like a, like a, I'll be on the, on the highway and you'll see a truck roll by yeah, and it's just feet to shit and you're like, oh, that's, that's what I want right there. And I'll chase them down, I got my phone out, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. And so the motivation, the inspiration is what, and then I'll, then I'll take that and then I'll have whatever project and then I can, I can kind of, okay, I can use a little bit of that on this one. I can, and, I, and I will use those things to kind of really get into that. One of the other factors involved uh, with color, this particular, is is building up the panels of kind of, of, kind of a a light area and a dark area, and kind of you know well, we, there is the color modulation thing, but but as far as tinting the work, I find that you could even with this process, I can come in and using kind of similar colors to, the, to what I was using with the dust, I can get the brush a little bit wetter, I can use a lighter tone of the base paint. And you can see I'm kind of I'm trying to get my brush to the right harmony here. So oftentimes I kind of go back and forth a little bit. I don't think that's going to be enough, but just a little bit more. So I put kind of these wet dots a little bit, and I can kind of So now I've kind of actually, in theory, in the modeling theory, I've applied a really light, light little bit of a filter in that area. I've lightened that tone of that paint up with just a little bit of that. So again, I'm using the basic principles of washes, filters, all that kind of stuff that we all know really well um, in kind of a little bit more of a controlled. And it's a super subtle effect. I mean, it, may, it probably doesn't even show up on it. It's a little bit, you can kind of see, but I've, I've started to kind of you know, modulate the panel, if you will. You know, I can start to do that. I can control these things. I can, I can maneuver all the way through the whole model this way. Um, and so what this does is, is, like I said, the power of this, what's really happened though, is, is it's, it's kind of really starts to Now this is a very different way of working on model building. I mean, this is, you guys are probably, you know, I know some of you guys are probably in your head wondering if you'll do this or whatever, but it's, it's something that I think, what's important to remember is it's not, this is not absolute. This is not a, a black and white philosophical issue. This is something that you can incorporate into anything you already do. So whether you continue to use all the washes and filters in, in the traditional sense, in the pigments and stuff in the traditional sense, um, you can incorporate this kind of a process um, and it just happens to be that oil paints are the best for this. This is nothing about you know me trying to sell oil paints or anything like that. This is just oil paints have a way to work and blend, and, and they go from I can make as dark like this little the little tip of the exhaust is just black oil paint, you know, and then the little subtle parts is just the dust is just just light color oil paint. So it it can go from you know 100% opaque o opaque to hyper translucent and all that kind of stuff, and um, that's its power. That's why it's so. I'm not switching products. I'm not pulling out drawers of other paints and other stuff to, to work with. And, um, that's kind of a nice way to. So I've just kind of, you know, I've just started to continue on the process because I've got this little roadmap here that I started. And so I kind of know where I need to take this in the next section. And that's kind of one of the things that I, that I like to discuss a little bit is that when I do these sections, I can do one or two of these sections and it'll tell me like how I'm going to do this section now when I'm working it. And so that kind of thing really helps me to kind of understand, okay, I can, I can come back and I can do this and I could, I could sit down like today, this is you know, the next day and I'm working on this and I'm doing some more stuff because this little area right here that I started with is kind of the opening chapter to the, to the book of the model kind of a thing. And that's kind of the differences between 
um, you know, really trying to do stuff that stands out and is different. I get a lot of questions. This, we were just talking outside. I was talking out uh, with, with Bernard Lustig a few minutes ago before we started. Um, I get a lot of emails from guys. There you go. Draw my pin wash in. Draw the wash, you know, putting the wash around this. I get a lot of emails um, to, you know, can you look at my work? Can you review my stuff? Which is fine. I, I have no problems with that all the time. But one of the things I usually almost every time respond to them with is, I do not, I have no idea who made the model. Like, I know the guy that sent me the email made the model, but it's just the model. There's nothing, there's, there's no signature there. And so I try to push you guys that way. You know, creating kind of, in your own world, how, whatever skill level you are, that, that you start to kind of stand out from your own work and it, it, you start to develop kind of a style. And that's, to me, a more important process of development of your skill sets, working with your style, working with your signature, so that when it's on the table, you know, you get, hey, come look at my stuff, and I, I know who did that. And that's a, that's a thing that when you, when you start to understand that, um, the game raises again, because outside it's really good, and then, okay, what's the next level? Well, I need to know whose work is whose. I don't, right now, I, I, I know who some of the guys are out there, but um, because they have a style, they have a signature style. But a lot of the work, the quality of the work is really high, but a lot of it is also, I don't know who did this. You know, not that I should know everybody, I'm not saying I know everybody, but working for your own sake to get kind of a, a that level, because then you, you will see those results in a year, in two years, 10 years down the road, if you continue, you'll see that result happen because your style has started to come forward um, by using the tools in a really controlled and precise manner. And that's kind of really what this is all about. As you can see here from, from just talking to you and, and babbling on and on and on, because um, I think it's important that I kind of get this hammer at home a little bit. It's not often that I get to talk to you guys about this stuff. So I, I will respond in emails, I, you know, and I said, look, I, it, you know, I go, for, I always do the positive and the negatives. Okay, this looks really good. Okay, you <laughs> fuck that up. Um, <laughs> what I like to see you do though is, is next time I see your work, I want to, I want to know that, you know, what it is you're trying to convey to me, or as a viewer, you know, what it is that you're trying to do. Um, and so that's kind of one of those things where I think that that changes when you're downstairs in those tables. You know, there's there's something happening down with the work that's presented downstairs on, on the on the contest tables in particular, and then on the internet, you know, Facebook now and all that fun stuff. Um, there's so many models on Facebook. Again, you know, I never know most of the time who it is, and I think trying to get you guys to that point where people post, and then and then you're like, hey. He's been doing this for a while, or he, you know, he did this, this, and this, and then you know, three months later, he comes back and he's got this, and then you start to see kind of a signature with the with the person's work, and and to me, I think that's a really fun, really interesting, um, you know, it's kind of like his driving style, you know, with race car drivers, you know, people have their different little versions. So, in the ways, the reason I say that is because we you know we are we are bombarded today, as you guys all know, with with the publications and, and whatnot, even my own stuff. Um, None of this is about you painting like Michael Rinaldi. That's not what this is about. None of this is about you guys trying to be me. This is not I mean, two shits about that. Um, and even if you looked at some of my work and you replicated it to kind of get your own skills up, which I've done before with other guys, um, this is really about giving you guys the confidence and the mental ability that when you sit down at work and you or sit down at your workbench <clears throat> and you start to do this, and you start to do this, that's when, to me, is, is becoming the important factor, is that you guys are, you know, you, and I think it's happening, you know, it's being embraced out there, but you're not getting in the, in the what I was trying to say is you're not falling into the routine of, of basically what we see in all the publications, everybody's trying to be that same type of person, and that's, I don't think that's what this is about, as a model, or as a hobby, or anything like that. I think there's a lot more to it. You know, each of us have our own little enthusiastic areas and passionate areas about what we're trying to do. And I don't think it's really good if, if we all start to fall in line with certain things that we see out there because it's popular. You know, and that's, that's, we see that in our daily lives with fashion and other music and other stuff. It's popular, so okay, that's what we have to do. And I just, I think there's, with this hobby in particular, to see real growth, to see it expand over time, I think when you guys sit down and do stuff and you start to, to move forward with what you're doing, 
move to a new level. So, let's wet this a little bit more. <clears throat> so what I've done, again, just continuing on, it's really simple, there's nothing, I'm not, I'm not doing anything crazy. A couple little tricks that I do in between a lot. Um, nowadays we call it speckling. Um, <clears throat> with the layers, uh, as brought up earlier, layers, really, really interesting philosoph philosophical process of layers. When I look at models downstairs in particular, and I see the, I see the finishes, with the weathering in, in, in particular, a lot of guys do that in one setting. Uh, what I mean by that is, if they're going to add to an engine deck, they're going to add some grease and stains. It looks like the stains happened in one day of the vehicle's life. Uh, and we see that a lot with modelers, where we'll, we'll come in here and we'll put some stains down. What I've started to do now, uh, more and more with the work, is I will speckle into the finish little stains and little drops and little little spits of stuff on this because when we see the real vehicles outside, the, with the matte finishes in particular with military vehicles, there's layers of stuff that happens. That, you know, granted, we see today like these guys, were, they wash their stuff outside, but if those trucks outside were not washed for two or three weeks, there's days of stuff happening. And that stain that happened on Wednesday gets covered up by something else that partially happened on Friday. You know, and, and so try to get that into the, to this too. Because when we talk about layers and working in layers, that idea adds a ton of depth. And when you get up close to the, the little leg here, you'll see that there's, there's like 50 layers of little tiny little specks and crap and just stuff that I put on that just by doing what I'm going to show you right now. So I, I take my brush, I have a little bit of color in it. In this case, I've got a darker color. Um, and you, could use, you can use tone on tones, you can use browns on browns. Um, and I'm just going to flick. And you've seen the speckling thing done 10,000 different ways. That's all well and good. Um, this is a little bit different. What I'm trying to do <clears throat> in a scale replica effect is just kind of get the paint to have a little bit of, of life to it. There's just, there's just something to it when you do this. And so these first little droplets, that, that they will actually dry and disappear, half of them. You can see how I flick this brush. I don't know if it's just... Let me do this, sorry. Try to get this so you guys can see. So I've got just the end of a tweezers here. It doesn't matter what you use. Um, but you can see my brush, the, again, the, the tiny little brushes. And they're just, they're just, I don't know. Can you just see that? There's these tiny little specks coming in of just a subtly different color. It's just a little bit darker than the, than the base color. And you can, you can change it up a little bit. Because when, when these things drive around in the dirt and all that stuff, stuff gets thrown up all the time, or the crew figures, you know, they're always whatever, or the weather, you know, there's always moisture in the weather. Um, you can go light colors. And what this does, and I, and I will do this probably 10 to 12 times throughout the course of the model as this is going on. Because um, what I'm trying to do is, what I'm trying to say is, when I go downstairs and I see it's a paint job with some whitewash, there's no depth to that. Like I can see that when that stops. And so what I'm trying to do is create a process. And because I did this too, it's, it's, I'm guilty of this too. Where I would look at it and go, God, it just looks like two colors of paint, and it doesn't look like it'd been, you know, two colors of paint for weeks in the battlefield. It didn't look like that to me. So what I'm trying to do is 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 pull into this into the paint stuff I see like on the highway when you or you know when you're parking your car and you look at your neighbor's car who hasn't washed the car in, in two months, you know, because it's winter time or whatever. Um, that's very common. I live, in a, I live in a wet city now too and you know, I won't wash my car for three months. So there's just stuff that builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up. Well, that's, you have to paint that in. You can't sit down in, in one session and paint all the layers of stuff. I mean, you can, but it's not very efficient um, to do all the layers and layers and layers of stuff as like one color break. So I, what I'm trying to do is I'm, I will do all this stuff. I will come in and layer in some effects and then I will go back and rework some other areas to layer in more additional stuff in the same section so that I'm layering within itself. So then when it's done, and you can see it on the little cranes and stuff, you can see three or four levels of layers of, of different, uh, just the life of the vehicle. And that kind of adds a little bit of, of, of just quality to the paint in scale that just 
when you see that when you see the regular painted section and then you start to see the, the the section over here when you get up close there's a lot of little subtle things happening so I just and it, it's a soft flick of the brush it's not so then what I can do is and again let's to the layer concept so I've done this it dries hyper fast there's there's really nothing in there for not to dry it's not much but I can come back in and I can I can take my color and because there's already some of these down here I can start to come in I can enhance a few of them so now I so now what transpires is So now I've got now I've got two or three layers of stains on here already. Versus so when you look at this, it looks like the vehicle's been outside for a while. You know, you start to see that kind of process where versus me taking my brush, you know, taking this brush and then coming in here. And we and I see this a lot downstairs is, you know, there's your stains. The guys coming in here and doing this and You know, trying to do this, and then that's all they do on the back of the deck, and they'll leave that, and they go, "There's my stains," and so that that idea, that simplistic idea, and then transfer it into this idea where let's put let's put some extra life into this. Let's let's look at this so that when you when you get up close to it, like when you get up close to the grill, you know, the, there's just a hyper amount of super super tiny little subtle things, and even some of them don't even come through in the photographs anymore. But you can kind of see it in your own way when you start to look around these things and I just keep coming back and I can so it's a different way of adding a little bit more you know because I have a lot of old cars that's kind of where I, I got this from was you start to see the build up and build up and build up of all these things and, and that's what I'm trying to convey and get into the, to the storytelling part of the model building and the painting and so how do I achieve that and the, the little specs the little it's super simple I mean there's there's again there's I'm not doing anything guys I mean really this is I don't even know why you're watching it's like it's a guy flicking a brush against a thing. And and that's and it's honestly, I'm being really honest in this, by saying that is that it's this is really this is really simple. What you just seen, I've not done anything. What have I done? I've a little bit of oil paint, you know, a little bit on the brush. Literally it's that simple. And and to understand that and not get so concerned with overpowering everything. Like when we always hear over weathered models, it's because you guys are just, you're overpowering everything with the, with the consumption of all the products and the steps. And so I've streamlined it down to just a couple little things. And by taking those couple little things, you can, you're now in control of like a rubber, you can pull it as much as you want or you can, you, you and what that happens, the models begin to become individualistic versus every model on your shelf has the same sepia wash that you put on for 10 years on every single model. That whole thing, like that's what I'm trying to break the habits of, especially in America, man. That's gonna kill you. It's just that you see that every year, the same wash, the same thing, over and over, and there's no, there's nothing to look at anymore. We, we uh, lose interest. Uh, what about the building side of the things? The construction? Yeah. Yeah, they're they're way more into construction in America, but uh, with the kits today, you know, we're in a, we're in a weird spot because the kits are so good today. I mean, <laughs> I mean, even the shitty kits yeah. are good. Um, you know, we go back to the early Dragon kits, and those are fun. Um, new kits today, Mang and Tacom, and uh, you know, again, Tamiya brings out a new kit, and it's just. And that's the other problem too is there's so many kits out now. Well, how do we move through these faster? How do we get going to where we can work on this stuff and, and really produce a lot of work that is to the level we're looking to do? And so that's kind of where I'm trying to. Because as a professional, I have to I have to do the same decision making as you guys do. But the kits themselves become such a dominant force. You know, do I photo etch to put the barrels, the tracks, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I, a lot of these newer kits that are just so beautiful out of the box, you get right into this and um, you can start to really do some fun stuff quicker. Michael, for that process that you're doing, are you using dark colors or lighter colors or both? I use both. So the color for effect, so what I'm trying to do is, so this, this area here, is kind of the edge of the crew hatch. Oh, like the speckling effect. 
Oh, both, both again. So I will do. So I would do some. I, this has got some darker color in it. I'll get a little bit wetter. And so the darker stuff um, gives you these really soft little, just tiny little. And there's just and it's a and it's a darker in the sense that it's it's a darker version of the base color versus grease. So it, it's kind of we get these, uh, especially with the with the current modern uh, armor situations that we have. You know, we get a lot of high res high resolution photography now that like the crews on the on the top of the turrets. And if you look like the top of the vehicles and the modern photos that we see today online, the really high resolution stuff, the grit and the grime and the crap and the, just the paint, and it's a fresh paint job. It's not chipped, it's not scratched, but it's just that grittiness. I try to like, that's what I'm trying to get to. And so how do I, and so by building this up in between, so I will do the work, I will speckle some stuff in, do some more work, speckle some more stuff in, and then hand paint some of the speckles to be even stronger, more powerful marks and, and just, and so, and then when you see it up close, and when you take, I'll let you, when you guys take a look at this, you can you can see already when you get up close three or four levels of, of just tints and drops and little specks, little things on here that's happening. That now that vehicle looks like it's been outside for a couple of weeks because it doesn't have to be combat or anything of that nature. It just we're messy humans, you know. We just drop crap everywhere. It's dirty outside. It's whatever. So you know, rain and the rain spits down because rain comes and drops, and so it's it's all that, and it's really trying to. Uh, but th the color choices are versions of the base color for that. So what I'll do is I've got I've done some darker browns. So now I can go in with some little bit almost uh, like a white whitish tan color. It's a little bit little bit, and this this will kind of play up that a little bit of kind of dust and speckles and earth and. Um, and you don't use uh, traditional chipping methods uh, in this way. I mean, I've already chipped the, the model. The, the, yeah. But it, uh, at this time, no harsh uh, chipping mm -hmm. effects. No, no. I, and the reason is, if you if you look at vehicles outside, the hard chipping effects are uh, they're few and far between, depending on the type of vehicle it is. And for you know, and and there's a whole conversation about the life and, and over weathering and you know, Hetzer lasted a month and con you know, there's a whole question about how long it was out there for. Um, and all those are popular discussions. I do the same approach uh, with the same color on a very dark surface. Yeah, you just use lighter, you just use various tones of whatever the, the paint is. So for like this, like the, to do the T34, um, to, to switch to a green, uh, it's super simple, but using just the basic colors is of, the, of whatever it is, if you're doing a dark black or, or a gray, like a Panzer gray, uh, which is not pale blue, even though that's pretty blue. Um, Panzer grays are really dark, dark colors. Um, so just, to go to that, you, you use versions of the color that you have on the model. So if you have three or four colors, you know, the reds, the greens, the, the, the yellows, the tans, just use different versions of the paints here and, the, and they have. And so that's why the palette is important too because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give myself enough options that I can do all this in, in one or two easy settings. I try to make this as easy for me as I can. So, but for example, to, I've got some greens here. Starting to dry up a little bit. Take some yellow. Usually, I find the green color very hard to work. The very. Uh, when I I helped develop this new line of paint, I learned that. No, the, no, the, the, the oil color. Yeah, but uh, the pigment, various, yeah, the different colors, uh, whites, blacks, greens, pigments that they make the paint mm -hmm. with, they're they're different. Like they don't all blend out the same. That's why sometimes when we spray certain colors, we always fight certain colors so um, and the oil paints are the same way they just the way the the colors uh, and how they process in certain colors to make that color especially in oil paints because it's a very specialized process um, so that's what that's what causes that so I can do some and what about sparkling with acrylics you can, but they will dry to a hard edge. So the drop, the, the speckle of acrylic, when it dries, it always has a really crisp edge to it. The oils, even enamels are a little bit better too. Enamels would be a little bit superior. Um, you can, but it, it just takes a little bit more practice and skill, but you can do it. I mean, it's not impossible. It's just, I noticed when I tried it before, they dry really sharp looking you know and something so this when you see this is it's it's really soft and subtle it's almost 
kind of a blended in thing a little bit, so. And so this kind of process, this little speckling process, which it's kind of fun to do, honestly. It's, a, it's, not, a, it's not a hard thing. It goes really, really quick. You come in, you can come in and darken some browns with the greens. And you know when you when you get up and you can you take a look at this little hatch that I've just done. There's there's nothing I've really done to it, um, other than a few specks in, in of color. I'll come in. And I'm just kissing the surface here. The brush is the brush is barely touching. And I always have the hair dryer. I'm using I use the hair dryer all the time. So and it's it's going to be I mean again a lot of this, a lot of the ways I do things it's it's really hard for the camera to you really you know to see but just kind of you know, in here, I've just with a little bit of oil paint color, I've already tinted the edge of that hatch. It's a super soft, just transition of color. Um, you know, I can even go in. And this is what I'm, and this is kind of the, the physical reality of when I discuss and why I call it the oil paint rendering is because I'm actually kind of redrawing the model a little bit in an artistic sense. I'm, I'm repainting the model a little bit. I've got a base layer of stuff I work with. And then I just come in here and I'm, I'm really starting to to rework some of these things. Let's make them to make a really dark kind of green color here. Maybe it's a stupid question, but when it's finished, it seems can be a never ending. Yes, process. yes, you have to kind of and make you have to pull you have to pull the plug. Yeah, yeah you have yeah. to at a certain point you have to say, yeah. okay, that's yeah. enough. Enough's <laughs> enough. <laughs> because enough is enough. And yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I guess because I'm, I'm. It's not a joke. It's. Uh, well, I'm the I'm the worst. I mean, I'm perfectionist. I you know it's, shit's never done. I mean, I could I could sit here and redo. I thought about this too. I thought about uh, not this one, but the T72 from Tank Art Three, the modern one. Yeah. I thought about bringing it and repainting it for the demo, because I'm not happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> Did I mean it's it's okay. I mean I, in the in the concept of what I wanted to do with that project and it just it sits there and I see it and I'm like. Damn it! I just I wish I had done some other things, and I thought, well, that would be a fun way to do a demo because you guys would be like, "What is he fucking doing?" It's like the whole thing is like, no. I mean, I, there's some of these I do like and won't touch, but this this Strim up, it's I've this is twice now I've painted this one, just right over it, and it's in the new it's in the new version of the tank art where I talk about that. I just I had it as a paint job, it was okay, I, it was in the closet. It just it was kind of this the model did nothing, and then I just screw it. I'm gonna do something else, and you can you can do that. It's not. Really wanted to buy it, to be yeah. it wasn't going anywhere. Nobody was. Nobody was gonna was gonna pick it out of the closet for me. So, um, that kind of idea, um, I like that idea a little bit. You know, I like sometimes when we do the Tiger One in particular. If you've read that story, uh, I took it to Euro and I got a silver, and I was like, in my head when I was flying home, the whole time in the plane, I was like, I just fucking hated that. I was like, this is not what I wanted it to be and I knew I could do better and so I just left it as it is and I, and I reattacked it I went back into it uh, without stripping I mean I didn't do it I just basically layered on top of it what I'd already done um, and that's actually when I started to really understand the power of layers is when I went back to an old model and started adding new stuff to it I'm like oh okay now I've got a level of depth that I was looking for that I was never achieving because I, I was trying to do it all at once you know and my layers were not happening that way and that was something that as a professional and is trying to do that and trying to get to that point and you know, like I, I just you really want to get into that and discovering some of those things about 
you know, that's kind of why I brought this one because I've I've worked on this one for for two or three years, just on and off, on and off with the with the with the seminars and stuff, and you know, even now getting into the turret and. There will be a depth, like what I'm thinking of doing is I will repair the whole thing. The pieces break in the plane all the time. Um, it's Dragon, this is that old Dragon plastic T-34, it's real brittle. It's not a fun kit, but um, <clears throat> I think it will be fun to, to finish this particular model off as a seminar model and get it all completely done and you know put it out there and just show you guys. So, um, because it's a lot of these conversations, the reason I have you guys try to ask questions as much as you can is because I take away from this seminar what you guys are looking for as well like what it is you guys are kind of what you want from me a little bit in, in essence so um, Mike, how are we doing a question about specking how do you approach when it's a three tone camera okay so that's okay um let's get into it i'm not worried about it's it it's going to bring the model about the question <laughs> <laughs> <It's been amazing. laughs> don't have a much <laughs> okay I don't have a lot of red, but what I um, so I've got I've got kind of that rusty brown color here. Let's clean off the green a little bit. One of the things that I'm doing, the difference when speckling, look at the distance from the model I am, and look at how gentle the speckling is. So I can almost control it. I can almost aim it, if that makes sense. So the, the this type of speckling is is very very different than when you're trying to put mud with the airbrush and your squirt, that's, this is not what I'm doing. This is not that conversation. It's the same name. I don't want to come up with another new name. People hate that shit, so I just <laughs> give it up. Um, so these little speckles, these little droplets of color. So I can, so I, keep, I kind of unload the brush. And so this is what I'm trying to get some of that liquid out. I don't want it too wet. So I'm, you know, what is that? A centimeter away a little bit. Nothing's really happening. So when nothing happens, you just kind of reload it. You, sometimes you'd have to find that sweet spot. You, you, you chase it a little bit when you start off, but. So I can I can just speckle over that over the, over the red area, and some of this will get on the yellow, and some of it will get on the other colors. But so I can make the green one up here. So you can come in now, and you can just to, they get pretty close to the surface. Just look at, I'm barely kissing that. That is that is just a millimeter of the tip of the brush is being used. One of my personal philosophies kind of thing, um, kind of barometers, if you will, my mantra, whatever you want to call it, control and precision is really kind of the heart of a lot of this. Being in control the entire way through. I'm not a fan of, of especially with the, if there's aircraft guys in here, I do not like when you put the washes all over the whole plane and you wipe it all back off. To me, that is just like, there's a thousand other ways that that can, that can be done to a, to a much higher level. Um, what happened, the reason I say this is because when you go down there, it looks like they're all done that same particular way, that process. By switching up and isolating, and it's kind of like the internet where we break up all the cells, when you, when you break up kind of the process into little localized sections and then work those around, the effect, the result is very different, a little bit more realistic, a little bit more natural, if that's a, a better word to use, um, versus kind of the quilted, everything's so precise and, and that we followed for years. And so this kind of idea, being really, really in control with a lot of precision, and I think that it kind of allows us to really start to change how we kind of produce the models a little bit. Because there is a lot of similarities between projects and whatnot and, and when you go downstairs and look at it, there is a lot of similarities, even though the quality is really nice, the, the, the execution is really nice, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of similar work down there because we're all doing the similar things. 
And what I'm trying to get the point across is that when you change this into an isolated format and doing, doing a section, if you do one wing, totally finish it out. It's going to look very different as a finished product of, of a final version of the aircraft than the old process of always doing the, the panel washes the same way and that kind of stuff. And that's where you'll change your work. That's where you'll change up all your, allow you that ability to move past the traditional process and into another type of version of modeling that it will be fresh. It'll be original, it'll be yours. And that's kind of even more important, I think, versus is it a color modulated paint job? You know, no, it's, it's your model. And that's kind of what, because I can, I can come in here with all this stuff with this, just this little thing here. I've already started to tint the panels like color modulation. I've already added pin washes, filters, all these other things are all, I've already done all that. And that's, that's what I'm trying to get across is I'm not abandoning those things. Those are viable things. I, and I've dry brushed the edge of this dark, you know, so I'm using dry brushing. Um, I'm using all the historically traditional processes that we use. I'm just breaking it down into little tiny little groups of sections. And that's kind of where I'm, hopefully that sinks in a little bit. I don't know. Could just be you guys are looking at me like, what the fuck is he doing? <laughs> uh, we're all, it's warm and hot in here and it's tired. And I have a more general question. Yeah. In general, most of the techniques that we are have been developed for 135 scale. I do small scale. Mm -hmm. Do you have any specific recommendation in applying your techniques? Control, and, con control and precision. Everything that you're going to see here, there's one 144. Well, I've seen that. Yeah. You have done also something. Yeah, it's the same tools. I don't, I don't do anything different. Mm -hmm. I, I mentally do different stuff because I'm controlling. Sure. But I don't, I don't. When I do the, the, the little burger, the only thing that's different for me is it's faster because it's smaller. Yeah. I do not, and that's what I'm trying to, trying to under, So you guys actually understand, the hairspray chipping, the oil paints, all this stuff you can use them at any level of precision that you require. So if you're 16th scale, welcome my friend, good to Hello. see you. Yeah. When you, when, you, when you change your scales, and whether you stay 172nd, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and, and all those kinds of things, the, the techniques and the tools, the control and the precision of it, is the only thing that you're concerned about. So I don't, I don't, I don't change the palette, I don't change the thinners, I don't change the brushes, because these little brushes, that's a really nice sharp point. I could I could even do figures worth, you know, so it's it's kind of that. And that's what I want to understand to you guys is that this is applicable to everything. This is literally like tomorrow, if you come tomorrow and want to see this, I've got a die cast tractor I'm gonna do stuff on. It's applicable to that, it's applicable to the Gundams. There's nothing I'm doing between this guy and this guy. It's all the same little stuff. And same with the little 70 second skills. So, so I'm not and I do that for efficiency. I do that so I don't, you know, if you want to start a project of 30 second scale aircraft or something, that's an entirely different type of mental capacity than a 70 second scale, you know, little aircraft or something or tank or whatever it is because the canvas is so much bigger. But I just work in a larger scale of things to fit that scale. But the techniques, the brushes, those kinds of things, they don't, they don't change. And that's kind of what I've, what I've kind of, in my comfort zone, so I can move from a really traditional piece in tank art to you know a purely science fiction hypothetical but the techniques that the tools it's the only thing that changes is me so it really so the, to answer your question there's nothing that I'm doing different in 70 second scale when I did the little burger panzer it's the same process that where, where you saw me put the little color and tinted it in these little speckles I just do less speckles so it's, it's just and that's kind of one of the things that I've kind of I think there's there's really something here uh, when we when we do these kinds of things. And usually, what do you do dust with? Also with oil paint. Well, I, I will. What what time is it, guys? Who where are we at? Ten minutes to go. Ten. Ten, Ten minutes, minutes to go. We can go long time, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why I asked for the. I I talk a lot. Um, I asked to be the last demo because I oftentimes go just keep rambling on. But oftentimes you guys don't get you guys don't get to hear me. You read the stuff, but you don't get to hear me speak about it. So now you can connect that, and you can you can hear my voice in that in the books and understand that the philosophies behind this are the power of what's going on. You know, the all the chemicals you can control a certain way, but the why of, of these kind of things, and you know, what am, why, why on earth am I doing this? With, you know, it's because I realize I can I can change the conversation about the, how that's going to turn out versus what we've traditionally always done. And when that happens, then you can do a, you can do a model one way, 
you can do another one. And so now you've got variety. Now you've got interest. And people want to see this stuff because now it just doesn't look like the same damn thing that's happened all the time. And that's just kind of where I try to really, and I push myself that way too, because if I'm going to keep doing this professionally, the next book, you don't want to read the same damn thing that you just read in the book before. I mean, there will be some repetitive educational stuff, but um, the story of the project, the story of the Gundams, the, the SM3 book that I've done, it's a different conversation than, you know, Tank Art 4 in, the, in that grill. So it's, you know, but for me to do that, I had to figure that out. And that's kind of what you guys are seeing now is you're, the results of this is, is basically this conversation of hyper simplicity. The techniques are the same scale, 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 scale. You just adjust yourself, but the brushes, the tools, everything is all kind of, you know, that's kind of what I'm. So it's a little bit more philosophy today.